Okay, three, two, one. Okay, good evening everyone. I am Colleen Schnettler. I'm a periodontist in Cape Town and I'm representing the Society of um, Periodontology, Implantology and Oral Medicine this evening. I have a few um, announcements before we start. Please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab that you will find at the bottom of your screen. CPD certificates will be loaded to the SADA platform and you will be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. If you are not a SADA member, you will be able to create the profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. The event for tonight qualifies for one clinical um, CPD point and we are streaming live on YouTube also, so just in case you have difficulty to access the Zoom platform. Um, also, just a reminder, just to complete the evaluation of the webinar at, at the end. Okay, now it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kotze. Uh, we actually know each other from um, the University of Pretoria, and she was born and raised in Middleburg, Mpumalanga, and she completed her undergraduate degree in dentistry from the University of Pretoria in 2012, where after she did a community service here in Kruenstadt. It's actually my hometown. <laughs> 
She then worked in private practice in Johannesburg and Pretoria from 2013, while she was completing her primary subjects in order to apply for specialization in periodontics and oral medicine. She started her postgraduate studies in 2018 at the University of Pretoria um, in periodontics and oral medicine. And she's a mom of two girls. She enjoys running and yoga, and she's an animal lover. The topic this evening is herpes simplex virus versus recurrent aphthous stomatitis. Then over to you, Leander. I'm and looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Dr. Schnettler. Good evening, everyone. I hope that you enjoy this lecture this evening. Um, let me just share my screen and then we can start. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, all right, great. All right, so this is a question that a lot of us um, are confronted with on a daily basis in our, in our practices. So is this just a fever blister? A patient presents to your practice with a complaint of fever blisters in her mouth. What do you think of? What is the thought process with regards to diagnosis and management of this problem? This statement can easily throw you as a clinician off track. Oral ulceration is a diagnostic challenge due to the overlap in clinical and histologic features. Let's start with the basics. What is an ulcer? According to Robin's basic pathology, an ulcer is the breach of the continuity of skin, epithelium, or mucous membrane caused by sloughing out of inflamed necrotic tissue. Ulcers are generally confused with erosions, which is defined as a superficial partial thickness breach in the epithelium. There are many causes for oral ulceration. A clinical classification of oral mucosal ulcers may guide a practitioner through the diagnostic process. The purpose of this discussion would be to elucidate the difference between intraoral recurrent herpetic infection and recurrent after stomatitis, as these lesions are commonly confused. We will have a look at ulcer classification and where herpes simplex virus and recurrent after stomatitis slots in, and then discuss the cause, disease cause, what the lesions look like, how to diagnose and manage these two lesions as well. So just by yourself, have a look at this image and um, give a diagnosis. Is this herpes simplex virus? Is this recurrent after stomatitis? Just by clinically looking at it. What about this diagnosis? What do you think? So ulcerative lesions can be divided into lesions that form after a vesicle has erupted or lesions that ulcerate with no vesicle formation. Infection, immune responses, trauma and neoplasia may form ulceration. We will have a look at herpes simplex virus infection that is classic classically associated with vesicle formation and recurrent after stomatitis that is associated with an aberrant immune response. So let's start off with herpes simplex virus. Humans are the only natural reservoirs for human herpes viruses. Herpes simplex virus type 1 and type 2 forms part of this family. Herpes simplex virus type 1 is mostly responsible for orofacial lesions and herpes simplex virus type 2 for genital lesions. Clinical lesions for these two types of herpes simplex viruses are the same and similar tissue changes are observed. So the virus enters the susceptible host most probably through saliva or contact with active perioral lesions to the mucosa or the skin. The virus is then taken up um, by the sensory nerves supplying the affected area from where it travels up the axon to the ganglion. Mostly the trigeminal 
ganglion where the virus remains for life is affected. When triggered, the virus moves down the axon to the mucosal or the skin site where the initial infection started. Trigger factors eliciting reinfection are common cold, i.e. a suppressed immunity, emotional stress, fatigue, oral and facial surgery, facial cosmetic procedures like botulinum toxin injection and fillers, pregnancy and menstruation, indicating that hormones play a role. An interesting trigger is sunlight or UV radiation. This causes local immune suppression. And if there is virus in the epithelium at the time of sun exposure, lesion development occurs. These lesions can develop without a prodrome and may appear rapidly. They also tend to respond less favorably to treatment. Initial infection with herpes simplex virus in individuals with no prior exposure is known as primary herpetic infection. Usually when a granny or an aunt kisses a child, this is initiated. With primary herpetic gingivostomatitis, the mom will bring the child in, complaining that there were small blisters on the child's skin and or mucosa, and now there are ulcers. The child does not want to eat or drink anything. He has a fever and generally feels unwell. He also complains of pain when he must brush his teeth. Upon examination, you will see multiple ulcerative lesions of various sizes, as the ulcers may go less on any of the oral tissues. Keratinized and or movable mucosa. The gingiva will be enlarged and painful with punched out ulcers on the mid facial marginal gingiva, as seen in the picture on your left hand side. The tongue may have a yellow coating, and this may be accompanied by malodor, which is worsened by the difficulty to maintain oral hygiene. This may last for five to seven days, or in more severe cases, 10 to 14 days. In some cases, primary herpetic gingivostomatitis may also go unnoticed. In adults, primary herpetic gingivostomatitis is reported to be much worse as seen from the images. And in a lot of cases, the patients are hospitalized. The differential diagnosis for primary herpetic gingivostomatitis is necrotizing gingivitis. This will present with necrotic punched out into dental papillae. The inflamed tissue extends from the marginal gingiva where plaque accumulated on tooth surfaces to the adjacent tissues. Primary herpetic gingivostomatitis has second secondary plaque accumulation due to the inability of the patient to perform optimal oral hygiene. Ulcers will also be visible in other locations in the mouth, as well as surrounding skin. Varicella or chicken pox may also present with initial intraoral lesions, but these lesions are generally painless and the characteristic pruritic rash will appear on the body. Pharyngeotonsillitis can also be due to a primary herpetic infection and is mainly seen in adults, but may also be seen in children. These patients present with an initial sore throat, fever, headache, and a general feeling of being unwell. Multiple small vesicles then develop on the tonsils and posterior pharynx that quickly rupture, forming multiple shallow ulcers that often coalesce. Lesions that may present similar to primary herpetic pharyngeotonsillitis is hand, foot and mouth disease and herpangina caused by Coxsackie virus or enteroviruses. Hand, foot and mouth disease are characterized by vesicular lesions developing on the hands, feet and buttocks accompanying the intraoral, especially lesions on the tongue and pharyngeal lesions. Herpangina presents with lesions of the soft palate, pharynx and the posterior tongue. Infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr virus may also present as pharyngitis, but will be accompanied by notable lymph adenopathy. If it is difficult to distinguish between these lesions, serology or a throat swab can be done. 
Recurrent herpetic infection of the skin and mucosa occurs following reactivation of the virus at the site of primary infection or the surrounding epithelial areas that are supplied by the sensory nerve affected. The most common site of reinfection is the lips, known as herpes labialis, with a vermilion border as well as the adjacent skin affected. Other sites that may also be affected less commonly is the skin of the nose, the cheeks, or the chin. These lesions usually occur after a prodromal phase of itching, burning, paresthesia, and redness, as well as localized warmth of the involved epithelium or skin. Multiple small red papules then form clusters of fluid-filled vesicles that rupture, ulcerate, and crust after two days. The vesicular stage is usually the most painful and the fluid is highly infectious containing viable virus. Healing generally occurs within seven to 10 days. Reactivation of herpes simplex virus type one tends to decrease with age due to um, the reduced capacity of replication of the virus over the years. Intraoral recurrent herpetic infection, also known as recurrent herpetic somatitis, is uncommon and it's usually found on the keratinized tissues like the hard palate and the attached gingiva. Multiple small vesicles rapidly collapse, forming red macules that may coalesce. Central areas of yellowish ulceration may also develop. This form of recurrent herpes is rare in healthy individuals. And it may also occur following palatal injections. These intraoral lesions are usually accidental findings as they are not very painful. Intraoral herpes zoster may look similar to recurrent herpetic stomatitis. Herpes zoster is usually painful and follows a dermatome, therefore stopping in the midline. Skin lesions can also be seen as seen in the pictures, and this may accompany the intraoral lesions. Pain will be the distinguishing, distinguishing factor here. So herpes simplex virus type 1 is mostly diagnosed clinically based on the history and appearance of the lesions, and because these lesions are self-limiting. When the clinical presentation seems to be typical, to be atypical, confirmatory laboratory tests can be done, especially in immunocompromised individuals. A swab may be taken and sent for PCR or direct immunofluorescence to quickly obtain results. Viral culture may take several weeks, which means that pa the patient may be disease free by the time the results are known. A smear may be taken with a spatula and smeared onto a glass slide, which is then fixed with a fixative spray. This is sent for cytology. Serology may also be done. If done in an individual to diagnose primary herpes infection, a negative result should be obtained. In most of the cases, individuals may be positive for herpes simplex virus type one, as most of us have been exposed, even though we are asymptomatic. Like mentioned previously, these tests are done when the lesions present atypical and in immune compromised individuals, but this is hardly ever done. Antiviral agents used for the treatment of herpes simplex virus type 1 is known as nucleoside analogues. Acyclovir, valacyclovir, pencyclovir, and famcyclovir are all nucleoside analogues. All of them inhibit viral DNA replication, but do not kill the virus. These drugs differ with regards to whether they are given systemically or topically, the frequency of administration, as well as cost. Primary herpetic gingivostomatitis in children is mainly treated palliatively or symptomatically because this disease is self-limiting and the children are usually brought in after the prodromal phase when the lesions have been present for about two to three days already. Paracetamol syrup, according to the child's weight and age, can be prescribed. Adequate hydration is also important as children tend to not want to eat or drink anything, and this is to prevent dehydration. 
a no touch policy should be implemented as far as possible as um, auto inoculation of other sites may also occur. Primary apeptic infection that is severe in children can be treated with a cyclover oral suspension prescribed 15 milligrams per kilogram per milliliter five times a day for seven days. Adults can be treated with 1,000 milligrams of valacyclovir twice daily for seven to 10 days. This treatment, sorry guys, this treatment should be initiated within the first three days of disease. Recurrent apetic infection is mainly treated with topical therapy. If a patient has more than six recurrences a year, systemic therapy may be employed in an episodic manner or as continuous suppressive therapy. A systematic review and meta-analysis done by Chen and co-workers published in 2017 concluded that all nucleoside antiviral drugs can safely be prescribed for recurrent herpetic infection as recurrence is inevitable. This can be done on a need to treat basis or pre-eruptively as mentioned earlier. Recurrent herpes labialis is primarily treated topically. Fenovac cream can be prescribed and should be applied to the affected area every two hours starting in the prodrome. For, for episodic systemic therapy, 2000 milligrams of valacyclovir can be prescribed. Two grams should be taken immediately in the prodrome and then another two grams 12 hours later. Remember that this um, systemic therapy um, is usually given in patients that have more than six recurrences a year. For continuous systemic therapy, um, preventative therapy with 400 milligrams of acyclovir can be prescribed and should be taken twice a day for four to 12 months. Now, some of you might ask, what about drug resistance, especially in continuous therapy? This is a bit of a misconception and is not such a big deal. Viruses outside of the ganglion exposed to long-term low doses of antiviral drugs in the immune compromised may become resistant. Herpes simplex virus resistance is not permanent as only the virus outside the ganglion is affected and not the virus inside the ganglion. This means that when the reinfection occurs, the virus will be susceptible to antiviral treatment again. Other treatment modalities for herpes simplex virus is laser biostimulation. Diet lasers are most commonly used nowadays in the general dental practice and is known to have anti-inflammatory and analgesic properties. It also reduces swelling and accelerates healing by means of increased cell proliferation. Laser treatment can be used in various phases of herpetic infection. In the prodromal phase, laser biostimulation can suppress infection. In the vesicular phase, it is very important to drain the vesicles before biostimulation is employed as biostimulation may benefit viral replication in this phase, leading to larger, more painful lesions. Drainage of the vesicles can be done on a higher power of the laser, or in other words, the cutting mode, as this mode also employs biostimulation on the tissues as well. This may reduce the recovery time, as well as the pain severity of the lesions. When laser, um, laser biostimulation is employed in the crust phase, wound healing will also be promoted. As seen in this study by Honarmand and co-workers, laser biostimulation can be more effective than acyclovir cream treatment.
Low-level laser therapy may also be used in the preventative treatment of recurrent herpes labialis. This study done by Eduardo et al. showed that when started in the latent phase, the time between recurrences is extended. This patient presents to your practice with the complaint of fever blisters in her mouth. This is highly unlikely, as intraoral recurrent herpetic infection is mostly asymptomatic. These lesions are present on the mucosa and for this reason must be recurrent after stomatitis. The cause of recurrent after stomatitis is mostly unknown, but various factors have been proposed to predispose a genetically susceptible individual. Local factors like trauma caused by orthodontic brackets or aggressive tooth brushing, allergies to certain foods like, for example, cinnamon and sodium lauryl sulfate found in most toothpaste can cause recurrent after stomatitis. Poor oral hygiene leading to an increased bacterial load can also be a predisposing factor. Systemic factors like nutritional deficiencies, like your vitamin B1, 2, 6, and 12 deficiencies, folate deficiencies, and iron deficiencies may predispose an individual. Psychological stress also plays a role, as well as hormones. A lot of patients experience um, recurrent after stomatitis episodes during the menstrual cycle. Certain medications may also play a role in um, predisposing an individual to recurrent after stomatitis. And these medications um, can be beta blockers or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, to name the most common Certain diseases may present with after-like ulcers. Bechet's disease have ulcers affecting the mouth, genitals, and eyes. Magic syn syndrome presents like Bechet's disease, but also affects the cartilage of the nose and the ears. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, cyclic neutropenia and periodic fever, after stomatitis, pharyngitis and cervical adenitis, also known as FAPA in children, can also um, cause or present with after-like ulcers. HIV-associated recurrent after stomatitis in individual with a low CD4 count can also be found, and these patients usually present with large after. Recurrent after stomatitis is a cell-mediated immune response, resulting in an inflammatory process that causes ulceration. It can be classified according to morphology into minor, major, or herpetiform recurrent after stomatitis, with minor lesions being the most prevalent, or it can be classified according to the disease type as simple recurrent after stomatitis or com complex, where more than three ulcers are present continuously and it may also be associated with underlying disease. Patients will present with severely painful lesions that do not correspond to the size of the lesions. Prodromal burning may be present after which a shallow ulcer surrounded by a flaming red halo develops. These lesions are found on non-keratinized tissues with the labial and buccal mucosa being the most common sites. Minor recurrent after stomatitis usually presents with one to five ulcers. They are smaller than 10 millimeters. They usually last for about two weeks, and they are mostly found on the lips, cheeks, tongue, and floor of the mouth, and they heal with no scarring. Major recurrent after stomatitis usually presents as one to 10 ulcers. They are usually larger than one centimeter or 10 millimeters, and they last for more than one month at a time. 
the lips, cheeks, tongue, palate, and pharynx is mostly affected. In most of the cases, you will see these lesions on the palate and the pharynx or soft palate and the pharynx, and they usually heal with scarring. The petit foam recurrent after stomatitis um, present with multiple ulcers, 10 to 100 ulcers, and they are pinpoint in size, very small, one to two millimeters. They may also go less, and they um, are present for about one month or just less than that and they are usually found all over in the mouth but they commonly occur in um, the palate floor of the mouth and they can also occur on the dorsum of the tongue as well and they often heal with no scarring as well recurrent after stomatitis is mainly a clinical diagnosis um, a patient will most likely disclose in their medical history if they have any underlying disease that may present with aftis-like ulcers. If the patient is healthy, then it must be most likely recurrent aftis-stomatitis that they present with. If the lesions um, are associated with a nutritional deficiency, blood tests can be done to find out what nutritional deficiency it is, and then um, the patient can be supplemented again. If the lesions are atypical, like in this picture, then a biopsy can be done. The results will come back as non-specific ulceration, and then you know that you are dealing with recurrent after stomatitis. So how do we manage recurrent after stomatitis? The goal of management is mainly to reduce the symptoms as well as the healing time. Um, you firstly want to eliminate the aggregating factors um, like preventing um, poor oral hygiene. So you want to first reduce the symptoms so that the patient can keep their mouths clean. And then you would also want to do a scale and polish and reinforce oral hygiene practices. Um, also, you can prescribe toothpastes that do not contain sodium lauryl sulfate because this agent is um, an allergenic factor or um, it can also cause burning. So sodium lauryl sulfate is the ingredient that makes um, a toothpaste soapy and foamy. And uh, this can cause burning of the, um, the exposed lamina propria as well underneath these ulcers. Orobase or denture adhesive can also be used. Um, as a protective emollient. Topical anesthetics can also be used to just keep the patient comfortable. And in most of the cases, um, this will be employed in general dental practice. So Sensodyne Multicare, as well as Meridol toothpaste, do not contain um, sodium lauryl sulfate. So this can be um, advised, the patient can be advised to use these um, dendrophyses. All right, your topical anesthetics like pyrrol vix, Andalex C, mouth rinse or mouth spray can be used. Aloe clear gel can also be used, Remicane jelly, um, as well as the Daquidin oral paint can be used as topical anesthetic just to keep the patient comfortable. If this fails, then a patient can um, be prescribed topical corticosteroids. And this is the mainstay of treatment for recurrent after stomatitis. Um, and this fits the bill perfectly as corticosteroids are anti-inflammatory as well as immunosuppressive. So which corticosteroids will we prescribe for what type of lesions? 
So in lesions that mainly occur on the lip, isolated lesions, you can prescribe Sinolar 0.025% gel, which can be applied to the affected area every six hours until the lesions disappear. For patients with more widespread lesions over, all, over the oral cavity, a betanoid 0.6 milligram per five milliliter suspension can be prescribed. And the patient should rinse with this um, with about 10 milliliters three times a day. And it is essential that the patient spits it out so that we can only obtain topical therapy and not be subjected to systemic um, features or systemic Mm, absorption of this drug that may cause um, side effects. Lesions that are found in the posterior areas of the mouth, so the oropharynx, the soft palate that are difficult to reach, can be um, treated with Beclate inhaler. So one inhalation can be done twice daily until the lesion um, disappears. A large ulcer, as seen on, on Mr. Molloy's tongue, can be treated with a Dovate 0.05% ointment. This is a super potent corticosteroid, and this is applied to the lesion twice daily. Tetracycline can also be um, applied as topical therapy. And in this study by Viabala et al., um, a single application of topical doxycycline in the management of re recurrent aftersomatitis have been shown to decrease pain and speed up the recovery time as well. So doxycycline, a 100 milligram capsule, can be um, opened and then it is mixed with about 10 milliliters of water and the patient then rinses with it. If it is um, multiple lesions in the mouth that needs to be treated or a paste can be made. So you basically mix the powder with a few drops of water and then you apply the paste to the lesion. Um, it is important to mention that it does not taste great at all. It is very sour, so um, the patients may not like this at all, but it is a once-off therapy and it has been shown to be very effective. Topical therapy with your corticosteroids as well as your doxycycline treatment can predispose a patient to candidiasis. So it is important to just look out for that so that antifungal treatment can be prescribed for these patients as well. Right, so systemic therapy. Um, what if the patient, what if topical therapy fails? Then um, prednisone, 0.5 milligrams per kilograms per day for three to five days can be prescribed for these patients. And this is just to kickstart the anti-inflammatory properties and to just kickstart healing for the patient. Other systemic treatment that can be employed um, is your pentoxifiline, colchicine, dapsone, and thalidomide. These are steroid sparing agents. And this is usually um, done by specialists in oral medicine, this kind of treatment. So these are usually patients resistant to your more conventional treatment um, for um, cases that are um, refractory. Other treatment to manage recurrent afterstomatitis. So um, a systematic review done by Val et al., in 2015 showed that low levels, low level laser therapy can reduce the pain level and also it reduces healing times. And um, in the study, they found that low level laser therapy can be suggested as an alternative for recurrent after stomatitis treatment. So if you have a laser in your practice, go and have a look at um, the parameters that are used, um, I know there are meta-analysis and systematic reviews done by Al Braxton et al. And um, they, they have all of the, 
the parameters that can be used or just have a look at your diode lasers um, instructions. I know that a lot of them come with pre-settings as well. So in conclusion, these are the two images that I asked you initially to diagnose. So hopefully you can make a diagnosis confidently now. So you mainly want to distinguish between intraoral recurrent herpes simplex virus and recurrent after stomatitis. So your herpes simplex virus intraorally is, is uncommon compared to recurrent after stomatitis that is common. So if a patient comes to you complaining of um, fever blisters in their mouth, it is most likely recurrent after stomatitis that we are dealing with. Another clue is that your recurrent after stomatitis is found on your non-keratinized tissues and they are very painful. Whereas your intraoral um, herpes simplex virus is mostly found on your keratinized tissues, like your heart palate, and they are hardly symptomatic. Like I mentioned earlier, um, it is most of the time just an, in, an incidental finding. Um, the lesions may present the same, they may look the same, but these differences that I mentioned to you now will aid in diagnosis. And I hope that this will guide you in clinical practice and that it can um, help you manage these patients with recurrent after stomatitis easier and more confidently because um, it can be very debilitating for these patients. They struggle to eat, speak, and just live life to the fullest. So. Hopefully with this, you can make a difference in someone's life. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Leandi. That was very informative. And I must honestly tell you, it's a very important topic for our current pandemic era, because I've seen uh, quite a lot of patients with apathous ulcers due to stress levels and everything just increasing. Um, okay, let's go to our participants. Um, is there any questions for, for Leandi regarding this? Anything anyone wants to know? I think while we waiting and see if anyone will ask any questions. Okay. Um, okay, the Netraso asks actually if you can go through your scripts again. So she actually wants to know if you can just um, put up, share your screen again and just show those images if you won't mind. Yes, of course. I think, and then, yeah, while you're looking for that, um, a question is, do you think there will ever, ever be a vaccine made for herpes simplex virus? Any op opinion regarding that? Well, oh, I know that there are um, a lot of studies with regards to vaccine development, but currently no vaccine that has been developed yet. Um, I also think because a lot of us already have been exposed and um, you know you are genetically more predisposed to be um, you know, to, to have the herpes simplex virus I or your, your immune system to um, to pick it up and respond to this you know so I don't think it's really a viable option. Okay and then um, there's a a question regarding what is the antifungal used and is its dose for candidiasis, please. All right. So, um, sorry, guys, I'm just quickly running through so I can get Dr. Rousseau the scripts. I wonder, maybe um, Dr. Rousseau can maybe, well, oh yeah, maybe put it on. I think it's going to be quite difficult actually to share all the scripts. Yes. Um, so she can is there specific, maybe she was either you know, get your email or ask if there's specific scripts that she wants to see i think that's maybe easier yes so while she thinks about that um the antifungal agents so if um you have a, a fungal infection in the whole of the oral cavity um you can employ nystatin oral suspension, one to a th uh, one to a hundred thousand international units. 
the patient can use one to two millimeters four times a day, milliliters four times a day for um, about 14 days, 10 to 14 days, and that will clear up the fungal infection. If it is a localized fungal infection, like for example, on the lip, um, if the corticosteroid has only been used on the lip or on the tongue, then um, myconazole oral gel can be, can be prescribed for these patients that they apply four times a day on that area as well, also for about 14 days. Um, it is important also with the myconazole oral gel, please um, do not prescribe it to patients that are on warfarin treatment as it can have detrimental side effects or drug interactions. Okay, thank you very much. I think that is very informative. We have a different, there's a bit of off topic. Um, I'm gonna ask it, um, just treatment for angular colitis. Would you, any recommendations while we on treatment at the moment? Um, okay, yes. So angular colitis um, can be either due to just a fungal infection, candidiasis infection, or it can be a combination of candidiasis and your Staphylococcus aureus. So um, in most of the cases, it's uh, the combination of, uh, of candida and your Staph aureus. So their um, uh, antibacterial and antifungal agent, let me just quickly think what the name is, um, Supraban, your Bactroban ointment. Bactroban, yeah. Yes, can be applied as it has antifungal as well as antibacterial um, agents. I've actually also found that if you um, alternate that with some with a corticosteroid as well, because there's a bit of an inflammatory response there, then it yes. actually works well as well. Okay, let me see. Yeah, um, can we have questions regarding please explain the magic syndrome but i think well, that's a bit off topic for this evening i don't know if you want to answer it you can but i think um you yeah, know this it's quite a it's not a common disease that we actually see if you want to mention yeah. something you did you wrote your pathology recently so you <laughs> <laughs> let me just quickly explain the magic syndrome um so the patients also present with your um oral and genital alterations, um, also um, skin alterations. And then the patient also presents with inflamed cartilage of the nose and the ears. So that is the, the main things that I can, that I can add. But um, highly unlikely that you will see this. And the patient will come to you with um, the disease being diagnosed previously. And then we have a question regarding um, for how long can recurrent aphthous stomatitis last if left untreated? So I think you, are, you can go into that. depends on what lesion it is. Yeah, well, generally, um, the ones that, that we will be confronted with will be your minor aphthous stomatitis. And that's generally for about 10 to 14 days that the patient will have your your um, after stomatitis. And yes, it, it will um, resolve spontaneously, but it is very painful. So that's why we want to treat. Okay. And then um, from Lauren Stapelberg, will application of a block of ice help with the healing of a herpes infection by killing the virus and helping with an anti-inflammatory action? I think it is more just of a feel good. I don't know if it will kill the virus. Um, yeah, if you have any <laughs> articles that um, that show that, but nothing that I've read with regards to that. Yeah, I also think it's more the the anti-inflammatory action where you actually decrease the vasodilation and yes. you, you're also basically helping with that. So it does, yeah, it usually does help with a bit of the inflammation due to the or the heat and the pain generation that you decrease. Yes, but not the not the, the virus itself. Virus. Okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah, like I said, it's very it was a very informative lecture, very well presented. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate that travel and the effort. I know it's quite 
quite hectic, especially when you still have to study as well. Um, okay, wait, there is some more questions coming in. Um, the, she requires a script when patients get more than six episodes of H, well, I presume IOP simplex virus per year. So I think it's a, um, a, a cyclovir script that you... Oh, uh, the IOP cyclovir, yeah. yeah. All right, let me quickly just go through that. Um, so for your episodic treatment, it will be your valet cyclovir. Um, two grams that is prescribed um, immediately. So you, the patient take it immediately in the prodrome, the two grams, and then 12 hours afterwards, they take another two grams. And then there's just a question regarding how do you diagnose the deficient vitamins like B vitamins? So you can send a patient for a full blood panel um, and specifically asking for the nutritional deficiencies. Um, you can ask specifically for iron deficiency, folate and vitamin B12, B12 deficiency. Um, a lot of the times clinically, intraorally, the patient can present also with um, a glossy tongue, loss of the papillae, um, redness uh, of, of the tongue as well. Um, that can also be seen in your iron deficiency. Iron deficiency, you can also have a look at the mucosa. The mucosa may be pale as well. So there are various clinical features that you can look for. But um, if you want a, def a definite answer, you can send the patient for blood tests. Okay, I think it's well answered. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for the questions and thank you for the evening. Remember that there's um, next week, we also have a few uh, webinars coming up. And yeah, I think that is all for the evening. All right, thank you. Okay.